yes sir yeah so uh, good afternoon everyone uh, i think uh, uh, thanks a lot for sparing your valuable time and uh, uh, to join this session which is a very very important essential session uh, i think almost every fellow should know this and every fellow should be uh, attending this if not all these talks will be going to be available in pcsi uh, uh, our official website uh, i think these are all something that is very very essential for your not only for your uh, Uh, uh the exams but for your career also so for the first sessions we have uh, uh, uh the understanding the hardware so may I call upon the chair persons uh, dr b r j kannan and dr avinash who are currently present and dr sandeep mishra and dr girish mp who will be joining us over to you dr kannan sir yes so good evening everyone my sincere thanks to ramakrishna and pcsi for uh, for giving me this opportunity and we we'll straight away go to the topic so we have we have four session four talks in this session that is on catheters balloons stents and occlusive devices so let us start with catheters can i uh, request dr gaurav gurk from new delhi to start his presentation please you can share your screen and start talking good evening everyone i thank organizers for giving me this opportunity i also want to thank this man werner forsman who around 20, 100 years back in 1929 used a simple rubber catheter to pass from his own anticubital vein into the pulmonary artery and thus an angiographic film of the heart could be possible cornard and dickinson they mentioned it as it was a key in the lock that was that is we found the key to open the door so that we can use the catheters and the devices in our heart to perform the procedures what should be the characteristics of an ideal catheter it should have a better torque control that means we can manipulate it in whatever direction we want we can manipulate we should be able to manipulate the catheter it should have a good strength so that it should not break when we pass inside the vessel or a heart it should not break inside it should be flexible so that it can go easily into difficult lesions difficult anatomy we can pass the catheter very easily the tip of the catheter should be atraumatic so that we should not injure the intima we should not injure the vessel wall and doesn't cause injury into the vessel obviously it should be radio opaque so that it should be easily visible under the fluoroscopy it should have a good memory that means it should remember its shape whenever we pass the catheter inside a short sheath or a long sheath as soon as it, it comes out of that sheath it should regain its original shape the friction of the catheter from the surfaces should be very low like from the guide wire or the vessel wall it should not rub against them so what are the parts of a catheter the catheter has a hub a shaft and a tip and the curves which are given differently by the different manufacturers so hub is made up of plastic or a metal from where we hold the catheter and the hub tapers off so that the wire can go easily in, inside the shaft the shaft is made up of different materials to give it a characteristic of a ideal catheter different manufacturers they make it differently with different materials now coming upon the curves of the catheter so it has a primary curve secondary curve or some catheters have tertiary curves also primary curve is present close to the tip like in case of a right jutkin catheter the primary curve is given so that it can fit, fit easily into the right coronary ostia and secondary curve is given so that the catheter can fit easily into the aorta according to the size of the aorta the secondary curves are given and accordingly the numbers are given to the right jutkin's catheter now how to measure the catheter catheters are measured in french scale one french is equal to 0.33 mm that means roughly a one third of a millimeter is a one french so catheters are measured from their outer diameter not from inner diameter they are available from 3 french to 8 french 
थ्री फ्रेंच इज रेडली नॉट अवेलेबल इन आर कंट्री बट इन वेस्टर्न कंट्रीज थ्री फ्रेंच कैथेटर्स आर अवेलेबल सो वट इज द मेटीरियल विद विच अ कैथेटर इज मेड अप ऑफ सो इट हैज आउटर जैकेट स्टेनलेस स्टील ब्रेडिंग एंड इनर लेयर आउटर जैकेट इज यूजली मेड अप ऑफ पॉलीथेन और पॉलीथाइलिन बट डिफरेंट मैन्युफैक्चर दे यूज डिफरेंट मेटीरियल्स बट कॉमनली मेटीरियल्स आर यूज आर पॉलीथेन और पॉलीथाइलिन सम मैन्युफैक्चर दे यूज डेक्रोन ऑल्सो सो आउटर जैकेट गिव स्ट्रेंथ इट गिव फ्लेक्सीबिलिटी इट इज किंग रेजिस्टेंस and braiding is done so that we can give adequate torque and it should be kink resistance internal lumen is usually made up of ptfe so that there is smoothness in the vessel and it should be device compatible it should not rub against the materials and it should not absorb the water what are the types of the catheter which we use catheters are basically of two types one is torque controlled and other is flow directed torque controlled catheters and flow directed catheters have some basic differences in them torque controlled catheters are stiff we can manipulate them with our hands on the other hand flow directed catheters they go with the flow of the artery or the vein in which we are passing the catheters flow directed catheters usually have a small balloon at their tip so it helps in propulsion of that catheter into the blood stream there are certain disadvantages of flow directed catheter that is flow directed catheter obviously they go along with the blood stream and they can easily go where the blood goes but they cannot go against the blood flow suppose if we want to pass the flow directed catheter from the ivc to the ra to the svc it will not easily go from the ra to the svc against the blood flow similarly in regurgitant lesions the flow directed catheters they don't easily go for example if there is a severe tr it it will not easily pass from the ra to the rv it will again fall back again and again because of the severe tr but on the other hand if we take a torque control catheter that we can pass easily from ivc to the ra then to the svc because these catheters are stiff as compared to the flow directed catheters and we can easily pass them in the structures which are against the blood flow similarly in regurgitant lesions these torque control catheters can go with small manipulations but obviously there is a disadvantage that too much of manipulations and because of their stiffness they can easily injure the vessel they can easily injure the heart so we should be very careful with these catheters when we are using them and these catheters have sub types like they can be used for diagnostic purposes or they can be used for angiographic purposes diagnostic purposes means these catheters are open ended without side holes and angiographic catheters are usually with multiple side holes so what is the advantage of a multiple side hole catheter as compared to a end hole catheter so when we are using a side hole catheter for angiographic purposes we give dye into the catheters so that the dye should spread equally in all the holes and there should be a equal spread of the pressures in the holes so that we can we should not injure the vessel wall but on the other hand if we use open ended catheter for angiography suppose we are using a power injector for open ended catheter and we are using uh, for it angiography then we can easily injure the vessel wall because there will be a single stream high pressure stream which will directly hit the vessel wall and we can easily injure it other disadvantage is that the catheter can ricochet it can cause a serious whiplash injury when we are giving a power injector 
inside a diagnostic catheter which is open ended without side holes so that's why manufacturers they give side holes to the catheter so that the angiography can be done very easily so these are the different types of end hole catheters like a multipurpose catheter left judkins right judkins and cobra catheters they are different types of end hole catheters little bit about catheters which are very commonly used in our pediatric cath lab see different catheters are made with different curves and they are destined to may be used in different anatomy but that is i will say the type of catheter which is used is should be operator choice some catheters are favorite for particular operator and with his experience he learns that in these kind of anatomies i can use these catheters very easily so there is no strict dictum that it should this particular catheter should be should only be used for this anatomy but it should be a operator choice that whatever in whatever anatomy he is feel comfortable that this catheter can go very easily he can use it according to his experience so a multi purpose catheter a right jetkin catheter a pigtail catheter these catheters are very commonly used in our pediatric cath labs multi purpose catheters was designed by schumacher it it, it is of two types MPA and MPB. MPA has a 120 degree curve, and MPB has a gradual 90 degree curve. Their subtypes are MPA1 and MPA2. MPA1 is a diagnostic catheter with a single end hole, and MPA2 has two side holes along with one end hole. These are the MPA catheters. now coming on to angiography catheters the most commonly used catheters are pigtail or angiobaumann were designed by judkins so it has a terminal 5 cm which coils back on itself and forms a tight loop like a pigtail that's why the name is given pigtail so it has 4 to 12 side holes they are located in the terminal 5 cm inside the loop so that it doesn't cause injury when we take angiography with the help of this catheter so these are the examples these are the pictures of a pigtail catheter b is the usual pigtail a is the angled pigtail which is sometimes but not very commonly used it is sometimes used in mid lv angiography c is the reverse angled pigtail D is the wedge catheter that is known as Swan Gange catheter. F is the typical Burman catheter which has a balloon at the tip and proximally there are holes. And E is the reverse. And now some basic differences between the guide catheter and the diagnostic catheter. Guide catheters are, if we talk about RCA catheters, they are stiff. They are a larger internal diameter to accommodate the larger devices. to accommodate stents and they are more angulated as compared to the diagnostic catheters and they have more layers inside them for better reinforcement thanks a lot so thank you uh, dr gauru so what dr gauru has uh, shown us is that he has shown some general characteristics uh, characteristics of various catheters he has not uh, very particularly told which catheter for which intervention or which diagnostic purpose uh, he just mentioned in between that it has to be uh, left to the uh, operator an operator will choose the cath catheter of the, his choice so most of the time a couple of basic catheters are enough for most of our diagnostic in, uh, investigations like multipurpose catheter and the jerkins right catheter that is enough for all the right heart studies for left heart study pigtail catheter so these are the three important catheters multipurpose catheters jerkins right catheters and pigtail catheters are enough for all the or almost 90 19% of the diagnostic procedures only when it comes to interventions we need slightly more specialist catheters okay so thank you for the uh, kind of you know uh, giving an outlook on the catheters any comments on other coach persons or other presenters we have another some 2 minutes before we go for the next talk 
Now, angioperman catheter is extremely useful, especially for uh, for small children with uh, uh, where when you want some right ventricle angiogram or things like that. If you don't want to injure the um, wall, you know, angioperman catheter is very beneficial, but not very commonly available. So we end up using PTL catheter for right heart angiogram also. But for older children and adults, the regular PTL catheter is good enough for angiogram because the the right ventricle size is big enough to have all the holes within the ventricle. But in smaller children, the holes should be in the right atrium, so we won't get a good angiogram. So smaller children, it is a problem, and we need to have a Berman angiogram if you want to have a specific right ventricular angiogram or pulmonary artery angiogram. Uh, good, good evening, sir. This is Prashant here. Yes, Prashant, please. Uh, just want to add a, a little bit of information regarding the angioberman catheter, which you are already describing. Yes. That angioberman catheter has a limitation in the pressure we can use and the flow rates. So the conditions where we need to give a high pressure injection, we cannot use angioberman catheter. And a NIH catheter is something which is available and uh, we can use it especially uh, in the right heart studies where we can uh, we need to do a high pressure angiogram so uh, nih catheter is a uh, an option which is usually available Correct. and we can do it see nih catheter does not have an end hole we will not be able to take it over the wire it has yeah. multiple side holes so that is very beneficial for an angiogram so for right heart, it is one of the excellent catheters, but I wonder uh, that is easily available or not because we, uh, anyway, that's another good information that for right heart, we do have so one a catheter called NIH catheter, where then there's no end hole. You have to take the direct catheter bare and there are multiple side holes. It's an excellent injection. Okay. So thank you. Thank you, everyone. So let us go to the second session. The talk will be given by uh, Dr. Nurul Islam. He's the consultant and interventional pediatric cardiologist at Health World Hospital, Durgapur, West yes. Bengal. Can I invite Dr. Nurul to uh, start his presentation? So good afternoon. So can you share? Uh, can you see my slides? Yeah, yeah, we are able to see and hear. Please go ahead. You have sixteen slides. I have seen that also. Yes. Uh, good afternoon, respected chairperson, moderators, and my dear colleagues on the other side of the screen. Uh, we use the balloons in the cath lab when we are taking care of the children or adult patients with different cardiac lesions. And these balloons, if we look into the history, it is being used from early 80s. I'm not going into the going into the details. Different types of balloons are available inside the cath lab, and sometimes it's also lesion specific, the type of the problem we are handling. But uh, for a beginners, uh, I think we need a better sound knowledge when we are planning for routine ballooning procedure regarding the balloons and the procedure also. So I'll try to focus my presentation in the next couple of minutes within these two basic things. And before taking any ch uh, child or patient inside the cath lab, uh, it is always better good practice to have a check in the cath lab whether all the uh, hardware are available or not. Otherwise, it will be a big trouble, especially when you are taking care or doing a procedure in small babies. So, balloons we, we use normally for the routine valve stenosis blockage or some stenosis in the big vessels. Or uh, so these balloons are normally called static balloon, and its shape is cylindrical. The special characteristic of the balloons that it has some predetermined the diameter which comes only after full inflation at per, as per recommended the highest pressure. And this pressure result creates the high wall tension and which cause split or tear in the intima or the valve commissure and opens the blockage. And there are some other types of balloons also, which are not frequently used, but those are for all theoretical probably should know before uh, going into the lab also. The ideal angioplasty balloon uh, the characteristic it should be made of a non-compliant material otherwise the dilatation of the balloon will not be uniform and can cause injury as uh, uh, the surrounding structures low and smooth profile and its surface is very smooth the profile things is very important it means the diameter of the balloon had completely deflated so it can be accommodated in the smaller size sheath groin sheath 
And the shape memory is very important. Once the balloon is fully inflated, and after that in the deflation, it should come to the original uh, folds with balloons so that you don't require to hand folding. It will, should be puncture proof and inflation deflation procedure when done, it should be very rapid. So there should not be any discomfort. And there is a catheter, uh, uh, balloon is uh, placed over the catheter, balloon catheter. There is a hole through which the oil should pass and the appropriate size oil is important for specific type of balloon. There is an end of the balloon that is a smooth and very short with taper on the catheter. And that should be very short. And the distance in between the tip of the catheter and end of the balloon should be very short. Why? Because once it's fully inflated, this short, this, this, the end of this catheter between the balloon and the tip, it will be very hard and can cause injury. The length of the balloon also varies. It depends upon the type of the balloon and the company which are uh, producing the balloons. Other types of balloons like high pressure balloons, it has a high profile and it needs the bit, uh, bigger sheath and uh, the high pressure balloons are made of thicker material, tougher material can cause injury over, over inflation. Like cutting balloons, they have a specific micro blade on the surface at certain gap distance, 120 degree angle and those are used for very tight lesions and the other types of balloons like septostomy balloon will come in the next few slides. Balloon inflation is one of the important things which we should know. It can be done by regular syringes and also there is some specific devices. But the problem with the syringes, it is smaller syringes can create a higher atmosphere pressure. But the larger one, when the balloon size is bigger, then it's very difficult to generate the expected pressure for angioplasty. And also during the deflation, the smaller syringes will create less negative pressure. So you will face the problem during deflation and you can compromise the hemodynamics uh, condition of the patient on table. So ideally it can be done when doing the procedure by use of indeflators, which we all people are very accustomed, especially who are working in the coronary lab. Before going for a balloon dilation using a balloon, we should have good practice. Like you should study the images of the lesion on echo. You make a sound plan. You go for the vascular access and decide which sheath should be appropriate without compromising the injury the vessel and also you can take the balloon comfortably and the guider is very important over which the balloon is tracked because it has a two ends one is floppy and the stiff part so floppy part should be adequate to be inside and if the position should be imp important because if the floppy part is not too much deep inside the branch or any the, the distal part of the stenosis portion so the balloon will not be stable during the inflation and you have to check always the bust pressure because it can if you limit the bust pressure so it can injure, cause the rupture of the balloons so all this information are uh, very easily available from the packaging system outside is printed so balloon preparation we, for inflation we need to contrast diluted contrast that is one of the very tricky point if it is diluted at lower dilution so uh, i have a lower dilution that can give uh, create a problem during inflation and deflation. In the images, you can easily see the three syringes with three different dilution. One is to three, five, and one is to eight. You can see that there is not much difference between the visibility between these three syringes. But one is to three dilution can really cause the rapid inflation and deflation. So it is very important part during use of the balloon or inflation. And there is a septostomy balloon, which is used specially for congenital cyanotic heart disease transposition uh, intact septum. It's a life saving procedure. Sometimes need to transfer the uh, baby to proper center for specific treatment. This is a Numed Jet Z5 balloon. Two sizes are available, 9.5 and 13.5 millimeter with a balloon capacity of 1 ml and 2 ml. So if you inflate with 2 cc of contrast, diluted contrast, it can give the maximum 13.5 millimeter. And this bigger size balloon used for the larger size babies. Uh, and it uh, the recommended or guider is 0 0.21 inches. During the balloon inflation, we should keep in mind some problem can arise like deflation, deflation or inflation difficulties. But the most important is the balloon rupture. Once you cross the bust pressure, the balloon can be ruptured in sight. And there will be always give a sensation, feelings by the operator. And there is a uh, washout of the dye from the balloon area. 
So the rupture can happen. There's a longitudinal rupture, which is not much problematic. If you are careful, you can take the balloon completely out and it can be circumferential, which is little bit of tricky or can create a problem because the distal part of the ruptured balloon can evert like an umbrella and it can be entrapped within the structures, intracardiac structures of the vessel. So be very careful. And the, if the balloon is kept for a long time inside the packet, so it can cause the rupt fracture of the shaft. It happens very rarely. So you have to be very careful and balloon puncture. Once you are taking a smaller balloon and you are putting the hard end, stiff end of the uh, guide wire. So by mistake, the balloon over the catheter, shaft catheter can get punctured. And the balloon length is very important because once you are doing the procedure, relieving the blockage, the longer length is or can cause the problem to the uh, surrounding structures like when you're building the pulmonary stenosis, if it's the length is very big, so it can be uh, cause damage to the tricuspid valve, leaflet, caudi, or distal, it can cause injury to the some of the branch pulmonary arteries. Once complete occlusion, it can cause the bradycardia and desaturation because complete occlusion of the tract, it can cause the less cardiac output and low saturation. So the good things before doing or using the balloons in the lab, always check the hardware. You decide what type of balloon you want to use and size of the balloon. After crossing the balloon, you need a good air placement with the floppy end tool inside so that you get better stable stiff end of the oil, stiff part of the oil. During introduction of the balloon through the sheath, you have to be very careful. Balloon inflation should be rapid. And you have to deflate completely so that a partial deflated balloon has caused injury to the structures. During the balloon withdrawal, there should be always a gentle twist <coughs> movement because it will help, it will help to uh, take the balloon out very smoothly and always check the balloon outside whether it is intact or not. During the balloon angioplasty for pulmonary stenosis, the balloon side should be approximately 120 to 130% of the pulmonary annulus for good results. And the length should be appropriate for the size of the baby so that there is no injury to the surrounding structures. For aortic valvoplasty, balloon aortic valvoplasty also, you have to assess the length, assess the annulus size, and it should not cross 90% of the annulus because there may be injury to the aortic valve leaflets and there may be aortic regurgitation, which is very dangerous for the child. So it, these are the points we should keep in mind. During the coactoplasty, we need to check, we need to assess the size diameter of the distal transversage, the diameter of the aorta at the diaphragm level, because the balloon size should not cross beyond that. Otherwise, there may be injury to the intimal wall flap formation, and in future, there may be aneurysmal formation. So these things can be avoided by taking proper angiogram and proper size balloon. Balloon atrial septostomy, as we have discussed, this is very uh, good, important and life-saving procedure for this kind of babies. And the septostomy balloon, when you are inflating inside the chamber, always, if you have any doubt, you should check on echocardiogram, whether this is within the proper left atrium, whether it is not in the pulmonary vein, can cause injured, can get injured, and it should not be uh, within the uh, mitral inflow, it should not enter into the left ventricle, that can cause create a uh, problem. So, this thing is very important and whenever there is any compromise or problem or hemodynamic instability, stop the procedure, always take the help of the echocardiography and you assess, then you can go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. So, very clearly shown all the uh, various types of balloons, uh, the spindle balloons, the round balloons and uh, what are the various indications. <coughs> Uh, one thing, most important thing is uh, how to avoid the air embolism. You have to completely de-air. One important thing what we have to remember is, uh, Dr. Nurul, you can uh, unscreen, I mean, you can come out of the screen. Yes, sir. Uh, whenever, you know, if it is a new balloon, there is hardly any air, but still the shaft will have the air. So you attach your syringe at here and keep the syringe up and pull the syringe maximum so that all the air will come out. When, when you release the plunger, the contrast which is there below will enter into the shaft. So that's how you'll make it air free. The same thing when you use a balloon, which is a reused balloon, when you inflate, initially you inflate to the full, but when you inflate to the full, you can always see that two thirds of the contrast and one third will be the uh, air. 
again keep the balloon vertically keep the balloon vertically and keep your syringe also vertical and then give a negative pressure because the hole to uh, for the contrast to enter into the balloon is at the if you take the balloon it is there in the proximal end of the balloon not at the distal tip so you keep the balloon vertically and then give you a negative pressure initially air will be sucked in and it will come into the syringe and subsequently the contrast will start coming into the syringe and when you release the plunger now the entire thing will be fully contrast so it's very important that you have to dear yes very classically uh, told that is very important and when the balloon ruptures if the balloon ruptures vertically as he has said slow gradual pulling it's going to come out but if it ruptures horizontally or transversely when you pull it down if you find it any resistance do not pull it further you just slightly push it give a slight clockwise rotation and counter clockwise rotation slight clockwise rotation and slowly pull it down so that it won't catch any structure okay so that's the way to remove a, a ruptured balloon these two very important complications related to the uh, balloon he has elicited and he has shown all the uh, use of uh, okay, you know the balloon used for balloon interceptostomy balloon used for uh, all valvotomies and he said for pulmonary valve you have to go can go up to 120 140 percent whereas for aortic valve to stay at 90 percent or 100 percent and depending on the indications you need to change like coagulation if the coagulation is not giving up you can go for a non-compliant balloon but most of the time a regular semi compliant balloon is you know okay so thank you very much noorul so we can go to the next talk and uh, if the time permits we'll have further discussion at the end can i invite the next speaker uh, dr mohua rai uh, she is a consultant pediatric cardiologist narayana health uh, kolkata good evening everyone thank you organizer for giving me opportunity to talk in this prestigious forum without wasting my time i would like to start my talk my talk is understanding of hardware that is stent if i show you this specific case scenario and ask you what kind of stent would you like to put in such scenarios like discrete coagulation in an adult or transverse arch coagulation or near interruption in turner syndrome patient or maybe this one that is mapco dependent circulation in an adolescent boy or maybe branch pulmonary artery stenosis unilateral branch pulmonary stenosis in child or maybe newborn with ductus i i know that i will get the right answer for most of the time but if i ask you why you have chosen that particular stent in that particular position then i may not get right answer for every time we pediatric cardiologists are fond of devices we know a to z of devices but adult cardiologists who are dealing with coronary intervention they know stent better than us normally we choose a stent because we have seen our seniors have chosen that stent in that particular position so uh, today i would like to uh, throw some light on the basic of stent so that you can choose your own stent history wise first daughter and jutkins use a spring like uh, thing later on amar and charles mullin use the proper stent yeah here you need to understand that although this is the standard of care till now it is not fda approved so you might be thinking why should i break my head on stent whereas we are having lots of balloon because stent is sometime necessary balloon is not the answer like that if you are dealing with a long segment stenosis and hypoplastic vessel then the balloon is not the answer you need stent and sometime like that a total occlusion of vessel then balloon is balloon cannot do the justice whereas in certain structure like ductus uh, the newborn with ductus there is no terminology of balloon dilatation you have to stent it then stent bed can be classified into various way don't be afraid no need of remembering anything just try to understand material wise there may be stainless steel stent and the prototype is pharma stent 
you need to know that there is a coding type of thing written uh, everywhere that is here this is th 316 don't be afraid it is the combination or the amount of alloy here in 316 means high molybdenum and l means low carbon the prototype of platinum iridium stent is cp stent and the prototype of cobalt chromium stent is andra stent material wise the self expandable stent are mostly made up of nitinol and recently the biodegradable stent is the talk of the town there are various they are in experimental stages and there are various materials are used like polymeric or uh, magnesium or maybe biocorrodible iron what does it mean by slotted tube or welded tube slotted tube means a small or desired uh, length of the stent is started by laser from a long tube the prototype is armor stent what does it mean by we welded tube it is manufactured from a wire which is bended then welded the prototype is cp stent what does it mean by closed stent cell design and open cell design in a uh, simpler way closed cell means the one cell the corner of a cell is attached to the neighboring cell and which keeps a good radial strength but it is causing less flexibility to improve the flexibility some strength has um, improved by some uh, designer modification which gives high flexibility without compromising radial strength what does it mean by open cell design the geometry does not connect consistently throughout the strength forming incomplete or non bridgeable cells this is uh, somehow advantageous it uh, diminishes the minimization of force shortening it has got other advantages like if we are dealing with a curved structure then this open cell design can form can take the shape of that curve there are other advantages like uh, there is less chances of balloon rupture but the, these are also not devoid of disadvantages like um, it can cause is high plaque protrusion and there is a concept of hybrid cell like in andra cell the andra stent it is called it is made up of open plus closed cell size wise stent can be divided into small medium large or extra large small stent are mostly used in pediatric cardiology in ductal stenting part what does it mean by balloon expandable and self expandable stent balloon expandable stent means we have to print or there may be a pre mounted a stent which is mounted on a balloon crimping devices are available but i haven't seen that we prefer hand crimping but you can utilize umbilical tape balloon wise uh, the it is written it is theoretically it is everywhere written that the bib balloon is preferred because opening the stent is more uniform and there are other advantages but there is some disadvantages that is if we are using bib balloon then the sheet size has to be um, upgraded it so sometime if we are we are dealing with a smaller tip then we may use single balloon and self expandable stent i have already mentioned it is made up of nitinol it is very super elastic it is very low profile it can take a shape of a, any curvature but the radial strength is very low you may the thing that is 10 to 20% additional expansion is written with the nitinol stent due to its memory you may think it's maybe the advantageous but it is reality on reality it is not advantageous it leads to excessive intimal growth so most of the time in pediatric cardiologist are only using such stents in where like that of surgical shunt baffle or conduit what does it mean by bare metal stent and cover stent mostly cover stent is a thin cover made up of poly polytetrafluoroethylene or anything else in case of cp stent this is the covering there are various advantages of cover stent like if we are um, it can rescue us from acute rupture or acute dissection and sometime in complex coaptation or near interruption we should uh, this is a uh, treatment of choice this is a stent of choice but it is not devoid of disadvantages like it it needs heavier due to heavier profile it needs larger sheets and we need to take care of gelling of um, side branches 
nowadays uh, each and every com the tech lab we are um, supposed to use only drug eluting stents so um, and because um, uh, the adult cardiologist prefer drug eluting stents so we need to we need to compromise here we need to understand is it really harmful for our tiny kids or not some papers are coming they have shown really a serolimus group of drugs is very high in um, uh, day one or day two of uh, after implantation of such device in newborn but it's rapidly cleared off so we may uh, try to use such stent and there is i, I have already mentioned this is a biodegradable stents are um, uh, maybe it um, may be available in within very few years so the, the concept is very unique it is causing a temporary scaffold and it gives time for remodeling of the vessel and then it disappear from the body so i have already mentioned there are various type of thing like that of that is the magnesium alloy stent the problem with magnesium alloy stent is degrade very early within few weeks and it is not also radio opaque so we need to add some gold to see the stent there are gold stents concept this is also unique two half of the stent is connected with pda suture so it can gives a potentiality of the growth then how to choose our own stent we can understand the arterial anatomy and the dimension is very important we cannot choose the same stent for coarctation of aorta in case of adult or adolescent coarctation of aorta and same stent cannot be used in neonates with duct but what does it mean by lesion specific or physical properties lesion specific means if we are dealing with highly calcified structure fibrous structure then we have to think a stent with high radial strength if we are dealing in a fibrous with a increased propensity to the thrombus formation then we should take a stent with cover whereas uh, what about the physical character i have already mentioned we need a good radial strength um, uh, stent when we are dealing with a possibility of external compression now i would like to mention one or uh, these three that is what does it mean uh, by remodeling comfortability and foot shortening remodeling means if we are working in a top structure like i have already mentioned if we are dealing with a case of transverse arch coarctation then open cell design would be preferred one because it can take the shape of the transverse arch if, uh, whereas if we use the closed stent uh, design then there is a chance of um, uh, there is a chance of this may not remodel and there is uh, there is uh, it is it should not be taken so for this kind of structure we should prefer open cell or hybrid stent what does it mean by comfortability if we take a stent in a curve or tortuous vessel then there is a chance of a gap between stent and the vessel so there is formation of thrombus formation is more in such cases uh, the self expandable stents are preferred what does it mean by foot shortening the difference between length of the unexpanded stent and the expanded one is known as foot shortening most of the time open cell design causes less for foot shortening here we need to understand that if we dilate it serially then there is a less foot shortening if we acutely dilate that means if we dilate from minimum uh, minimum uh, diameter to the maximum diameter then there is a chance of foot shortening so we should keep it in mind at the time of selecting <laughs> so what are the ideal stent it must be low profile high packetability radio visible mri safe compatible it must be a predictable expansion with sufficient radial strength we should understand that there is no stent which is has got each and every ideal property so we need to um, modify our choice according to the availability so before you can go to the last slide please yeah yeah so we have done this branch pier stenosis with formula stent then we have done this coarctation in adult with non covered andra stent with this near interruption with covered andra stent and this is by coronary stent i was not bothered about the radial stent i was only bothered about the flexibility and packability and this is done with formula stent thank you everyone for your patience hearing you can go through these papers also thank you yeah so thank you so there was a very good uh, good review about uh, most of the stents which we commonly use
so she has taken the entire time anyway we can have one minute discussion if anyone wants to add something on this topic any doubt or any comment on this topic so why maybe, uh, maybe that sandeep mishra can add a few comments here yeah uh, thank you very much uh, i think excellent presentation uh, so far as the uh, concepts are concerned uh, i think uh, for every cardiologist we need to know one or two strengths which are good so let me just uh, say uh, regarding uh, some of the coronary strengths so the if you look at flexibility and if you look at side branch access then i think uh, the metronic group of strengths are very good the resolute integrity etc and uh, but if you look at the radial strength then platinum chromium strengths are very good so sometimes when you need a lot of radial strength then i think those are very good uh and uh, among the uh, platinum chromium even the metronic group of strands are very good so boston scientific and metronic group of strands if you look at closed cell design strands then uh, the zions group of strands are there uh, other than that i think uh, she touched upon bioresorbable strands they are very good when there is lot of bend or where there is a pulsation already present those situations bioresorbable strands are very good only thing you have to remember is that they have very little radial strength so you when you require lot of uh, flexibility but uh, you don't want a lot of radial strands then bioresorbable strands can be used and i think one of them is still available the meris strand is uh, from uh, meril life sciences is available still so i think uh, maybe if somebody has a question i think we can uh, uh, discuss that Maybe we are out. Uh, time is up, so we can go to the yeah. next one. Yeah, thank you, sir. So we can go to the last talk. Then subsequently we may have some few questions. So can we invite a Dr. Chandramani Adhikari, Associate Professor, National Academy of Medical Sciences, Nepal, for his presentation? Please share your screen and start presenting. Thank you. Uh, if someone is going to present on his name because i don't see his name here his talk is recorded so can you play that recording yes yeah who is in charge of that please record his talk sorry please talk yeah okay when uh, the presentation is coming up uh for all the uh, uh speakers and panelists here uh do we really need the pressure of needing a bioresorbable stent in congenital heart diseases uh which condition do you think that a bioresorbable stent would be an advantage over a regular stent the only condition where i can think of is a newborn coagulation many times we end up stenting a newborn 3 day old 5 day old 7 day old because of lv dysfunction or because of non availability of surgeon we stent him and it becomes a mandatory that 3 months or 6 months later we have to subject the child for surgery and then remove the stent and uh, do the corrective surgery that's one place where i think a bioresorbable stent will be of advantage other than that i can't uh, think of any other condition where in congenital heart disease or structural heart disease a bioresorbable stent <clears throat> may make a difference basically you know what you want is uh, when the child is growing and you require a temporary scaffold so those are the situations i don't know maybe dr rama can also add on to something if there are some situations but uh, you know that is the concept and uh, the other uh, reason where it can be used is when there is already some pulsatile lesion there so that kind of situation uh, by resorbable stent is a good idea you require a scaffold a uh, temporary scaffold and it's a pulsatile area because other things uh, will have fracture if you have lot of pulsatility so uh, i know that uh, people who are doing a uh, you know uh, a vessel which goes across a knee joint where you require lot of movement so th that those places it is very good but from for congenital point of view i mean i am not the expert so so i think okay dr rama you have any idea where it can be used Okay, I think Dr. Adhikari's uh, presentation. Yeah, presentation is, is ready. Please go ahead and present, please. On occluded devices in. In the prestigious conference. What are occluded devices? Occluded devices are made up of wire, mesh, and polyester. 
they are used for percutaneous intervention they are used to close a congenital defect and there are multiple design uh, for same indication from uh, is it possible to increase the volume the occluder device can be device divided into single disc occluder and the double disc occluder in single disc occluder they have a single disc whereas in double disc de devices they have two discs uh, which is uh, connected by a waste uh, based upon this clinical use the occluder devices can be div divided into pd ast and pst occluders uh, though they are designed for one indication and it can be used for other indications just like pda single disc and double disc occluder can be used for vst closure ast occluder can be used for um, uh, for post mi vst cases and even in some cases of uh, pda ast device can be used there are different brand uh, and this uh, brand are different in term of the design uh, they have uh, variation in in the in the way the device is designed uh, in their shape size and uh, size also uh, the uh, company have various size ast device uh, devices are made up of uh, neutral and interurban polyester they are double disc devices now waist size is device size so whenever we say um, uh, ast size device means uh, the, that is the waist size and left lateral disc is bigger than the right lateral disc you can see in this diagram there are four dimension a is waist waist size b is right lateral disc size c is left lateral uh, disc size and d means the length of the waist in typical uh, amplazer ast device and the right lateral disc is uh, 8 mm bigger than the device size in 4 to 10 mm ast size 10 mm bigger uh, in uh, 11 to 32 mm device and in 32 to 40 also uh, left uh, right lateral disc is uh, 10 mm bigger than the device size left lateral disc size will be bigger by 12 14 and 16 mm in 4 to 10 mm uh, ast 11 to 32 mm and 32 to 40 mm ast size respectively and length of the waist is 3 mm in 4, in 4 to 10 and 11 to 32 and 32 to 40 size the length of the waist is 4 mm multi septal occluder they are used to close multi uh, uh, oh. in this case they have a small waist uh, and the waist will be 3 mm and the device size is is uh, equals to left lateral size and the right lateral side the right lateral size uh, dicks and the right lateral uh, right lateral and the left lateral dicks are of same size that is how it different from regular AST and PFO devices those uh, devices are used for closing PFO uh, there is a small uh, slight variation just like in 25 and 35 mm the RA disc is bigger than the left arterial disc this is typically of amplazer devices whereas in 18 and 13 mm PFO devices the RA disc and the LA disc are equal the waist size is 3 mm in all those four device sizes. PDA duct occluder they are mushroom shaped uh, devices uh, single disc device and this device was initially designed to close v, uh, PDA but it can be used to close VST uh, transcatcher closure of RSOV it's also made up of needle wire and poly polyester fiber uh, the Typical PDA duct occluder had four dimension. A is a descending out again. B is a pulmonary artery in. C is the retention disc that is in the aortic aortic side, and D means the length of the device. In this um, chart, you can see how the size of uh, of 
uh, device uh, aortic end pulmonary end retention tick size and the length of the device varies between um, um, between the size of the device typically when we call pda uh, uh, 12 10 means the uh, descending aortic end is 12 and the pulmonary end is 10 this is how we decide and uh, in amplazer uh, 1614 device uh, is the maximum size of the device whereas there are other company they have bigger size uh, devices available uh, to close uh, bigger uh, pds uh, there are some special uh, duct occluder also in uh, regular pda and duct occluder um, the uh, pda uh, device is of a mushroom shape and then uh, uh, the aortic end will be bigger than the pulmonary end which we call as a conical sang shape uh, so in conical sang, sang shape the pulmonary artery end is smaller than the aortic end but there are some uh, design in which the pulmonary end and the aortic end are of same size uh, what they call is that straight sang uh, shape or cylindrical shape so the pulmonary end and the aortic end are equal size are equal and the, the other one is pda uh, occlutech design it's a reverse conical sang sec means the pulmonary end is artery end is bigger than the aortic end so how it is helpful and they, it, it is it is believed that reverse conical shape sang um, uh, 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 shape uh, this PDA occluder is stable at after the delivery, delivery or, or deployment and then uh, there is a less chance of um, device immobilization and other design is uh, hopeless design designed from LEPU in this in this device the uh, in all other devices there is a hop on the outing end, whereas in this hopeless design the the, the, the uh, left at left and uh, hop is absent um, uh, this PDA duct octopus double disc device is a double disc design, disc design uh, used to close uh, PDA. It was initially uh, used to close uh, PDA, but later on it was used to close VST uh, also. Uh, this is a double disc design, and uh, this 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 device is helpful in in uh, in term that it can be deployed from the pulmonary artery in as well as aortic end just like in uh, um, and single uh, dix design uh, device and it should be deployed when we close a pda it should be deployed from the pulmonary artery in whereas this device you can uh, use this device to close from either from pulmonary artery uh, end or from the aortic end in both way you can use this device these VSC devices are made from neutral wire mesh and they are double disc devices waist size is equal to device size and variety of devices from variety different companies with some variation are available um, in term of VSC devices uh, device uh, especially made for VST post MI muscular VST muscular VST devices membrane VST devices these are uh, typical uh,
a new uh, occluder that is left atrial occluder which is being used in uh, uh, all of, around the world for uh, LA occluder uh, occlusion uh, we all know that arterial patient arterial fibrillation patient are at risk of uh, stroke because 90% of the uh, clot uh, in AF forms in the LA and if we close that uh, LAA with the occluder then uh, the chance of uh, stroke decreases so in this procedure uh, is a uh, percutaneous uh, intervention where uh, LA occluder is uh, placed in um, LA uh, it's also made, made up of uh, nitinol wire and there are multiple designs from different company this uh, uh, oc uh, occluder is used um, for stroke prevention in patients who are not who cannot take warfarin or who are contraindicated for warfarin therapy or because of multiple reasons i think uh, i think we are nearing five o'clock we can go to the last slide and then we can end this session once again okay so it, that was the last slide yeah. so uh, good so it is not easy to present about stents in 10 or 15 minutes time and uh, you know we should be very very thankful to Dr. Amplat sir who created that uh, nitinol uh, uh, wire based device system which is retaining the memory only after his uh, invention the intervention in cardiology and congenital disease has taken up before that it was in a very primitive stage I can tell you so we should be very thankful whenever we discuss about devices to Dr. Amplat sir and it was a good presentation and uh, it's uh, exactly five o'clock so my sincere thanks to all the four presenters for giving the very basics of the hardware and hope that was very useful to all the postgraduates and other young uh, cardiologists. And uh, sincere thanks for giving me the opportunity to chair this session. Thank you very much. We can go to the next session. I can see. Good evening, Shokmar. Shokmar is there already ready? Hi, good evening. Kanan. You are straight from the cat. <laughs> Can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, yes, sir, we can hear you, sir. Yeah, thank uh, you. I think thanks a lot for all the speakers and chairperson. So, may I now invite the chairperson for the next uh, uh, session, uh, which is going to be, I think, a very, very important session. Uh, it's, uh, uh, it is, I think, where I think a lot of basics are going to be discussed uh, with a lot of uh, uh, time and... Uh, uh, Sorry, I, I got muted in between. So, good good evening. Ma ma sorry, sorry, I got I got repeatedly getting muted. I don't know why. Like, uh, uh, I think may I invite uh, Professor Anka Saxena, Dr. Sanjay Tyagi, Dr. B. S. Narayan, and Dr. Harshwajan, Dr. Sudip Kumar from Lucknow to start this session on understanding the hemodynamics and oximetry. Thank you, Dr. Rama. We can start with the first talk by Dr. Shiva Kumar from Chennai on basics of hemodynamic assessment. Dr. Shiva, please. Thank you very much, madam. Uh, thanks for uh, inviting me. Madam, I am audible and uh, my slides are visible. Yes, Dr. Shiva. Thank you, you are. Yeah. So uh, uh, basically, what I will I will do is uh, pr this is this is primarily intended for all the younger generation uh, developing cardiologists, both adult and pediatric. I'm going to divide it into four small parts to understand what is first a cardiac output. Cardiac output is basically defined as the quantity of blood that is delivered to the systemic circulation per unit time. We have to understand that this is the amount of blood that goes through the systemic capillary bed. And it is not the amount of blood that goes out through the aortic valve that we need to be clear about. So for, let, let, me, let me just clarify on this. For example, yeah, in, a, in a patient who is having a left to right shunting PDA, the aortic valve is actually carrying not only the systemic outflow, but also the blood that is coming back through the ductus. So it actually is the QP. So we should understand that the amount of blood that goes through the aortic valve is not QS and it is the amount of blood that goes through systemic capillary bed. I'll, I'll introduce one point here. If suppose let us assume in a pulmonary AV malformation, we are finding what is the QP. So it is the amount of blood that goes through the pulmonary capillary bed. 
So, how will you calculate now? Arteriovenous difference has to be PV minus PA. So, in that case, the PV actually will be desaturated because of the pulmonary AV malformation. We should not take the desaturated value. We should assume that it is normal at 100% and take 100 minus PA and that is the amount that is calculated as QP. So, the, what I want to point out is cardiac output is the amount of blood that goes through the systemic capillary bed and QP is the amount that goes through the pulmonary capillary bed. The, the, the formula is oxygen consumption divided by arteriovenous oxygen difference. So, oxygen consumption, how do we calculate? Previous methods were polarographic method and Douglas bag method, but now most of the research labs use what is called respiratory mass spectrometry, which is fairly very accurate. But practically, many of us will use nomograms from Lafarge and Lundell. Let's understand what it is. Respiratory mass spectrometry is sampling a small amount of the expired air which goes through a dispersion chamber and ionization chamber and it immediately tells what is the quantity of oxygen that is present in a fraction of air that is taken out from the expired air. So, it precisely tells you what is the amount of oxygen that is coming out in the expired air and from it you will be able to calculate what is the amount of volume of oxygen that is consumed. However, in order for the equipment to be very soundproof, we need to have a complete anesthesia sedation or sedation with mechanical ventilation so that there are no leaks at all in any of the system. And if you put a patient on general anesthesia sedation and mechanical ventilation, automatically the cardiopulmonary work reduces and the VO2 also reduces by 20 to 30 percent. So, even though it is accurate, the result that we are getting is not real, real value. It will be an underestimate. Doing it without any sedation, a respiratory mass spectrometry includes lots of errors and the value of VO2 that we get will be very erratic. Recommendation by the Pulmonary Vascular Research uh, uh, Committee says that the cardiac catheterization ideally should be pre pre uh, done when the patient is spontaneously breathing either awake or moderately sedated. So, obviously, we should not, we cannot consider a respiratory mass spectrometry to be the ideal method. So, for practical purposes, the Lafarge graph is the one that is going to be useful. Lafarge graph was actually derived after a study from 61 to 67 at Boston Children's Hospital on close to about 900 patients by the older Douglas bag method in patients who are between 3 to 40 years and they arrived at this charts. And obviously, none of the patients were less than 3 years, so it is not validated. So, how do the present Lafarge formula, it is actually a derived formula. So, based on the derivation, we look at a constant minus a constant into logarithm of the age which is subtracted. So, since the logarithm of the age is subtracted from the constant, the smaller and smaller the age of the patient, the more and more will be the VO2. So, the estimated VO2 by Lafarge method in a very tiny infant will be quite high. Contrary to what we might think, actually a small baby will have a relatively lesser amount of VO2. So, that is the difference between the estimated VO2 and the true measured VO2 and that is one of the fallacy of this Lafarge formula. So, in order to avoid this logarithm in the calculation, the next method is called Lundell's formula which is based only on height, weight and some constants. So, Lundell is basically a second type of formula that is arrived in Sweden from around 504 patients and this avoids completely all the exponential and log formula. But majority of us, we still use the Lafarge equations only. If Suppose if you don't have any of those equations in hand and directly you want to make some calculations, the average VO2 of a normal human being is 125 plus or minus 25 ml per minute per meter squared body surface area. So, when I am telling plus or minus 25, add a little bit for, more for a male and subtract a little bit for the female, add a little bit more for a younger child, subtract a little bit for a very older person and if the patient is sedated, subtract a little bit. If the patient is unsedated and active, add a little bit. So, on an average in and around 125. So, now we have, we have come to what is the oxygen consumption. The second one is arteriovenous oxygen difference. Arteriovenous oxygen difference is calculated by what is the oxygen carrying capacity into the percentage saturation. Hemoglobin is one derivative that is easily derived from the labs. Now, how is the percentage saturation being calculated? Percentage saturation is currently calculated in all the cath labs by what is called as a coximeter where the blood 
the a, a light a combination of red and infrared light goes through a chamber through which the blood is present and depending on the concentration of oxyhemoglobin and deoxyhemoglobin there is going to be a variable absorption and depending on the absorption we are going to tell what is the what is the uh, like percentage of the oxyhemoglobin and what is the percentage of deoxyhemoglobin we know that deoxyhemoglobin is primarily taken up by red light and oxyhemoglobin is primarily taken up by infrared light and based on this difference between the input light to the output light intensity automatically the machine calculates what is going to be the saturation percentage saturation and based on that we are going to find out what is the uh, oxygen oxygen content but whenever the patient is taking dissolve like in inspiring oxygen we have to take po2 also into consideration and so in that case abg is used in the previous generation machines like 10, 10 to 15 years before saturation was actually derived from the abg but now today all the current machines are called cooximeters they have they work on cartridges they separately assess saturation and PO2 and the saturation that is calculated is not derived from the PO2 in the present generation uh, cooximeters. So now we have understood what is cardiac output. The second one, how to understand, uh, we will understand how a pressure is being recorded. I will show one pressure trace. This is a typical example of a right atrial pressure trace where the right atria is showing tall A waves and then a deep X descent a small V wave and a small Y descent. There is a mean line that is coming here, which is basically the area under the curve. The area under the curve is calculated by every individual machine depending on whether it is a beat to beat calculation or whether it is under the entire page. So here you are able to understand that this whole page, the PA, the, the RA mean is around 8 to 8.5 millimeters of mercury. This is 10 scale. Now, when you carefully look at the trace, during inspiration there is a fall, that during expiration there is an increase, but since this mean is being averaged over the entire page, there is not too much of change. Now, this is a very complex periodic fluctuation in the pressure. So, how is it arrived? We know that it is through a transducer. The transducer carries a miniature circuitry which is based on what is called as Wheatstone Bridge Principle, a series of resistors behind this chamber. So, if there is a blood that is put, the fluid is pushed in the diaphragm, the diaphragm now pushes this Wheatstone bridge, the resistors closer or pulls it away. So, there is going to be a change in the resistors length, either lengthening or shortening. That is going to change the resistance and when the resistance is changed, the input voltage and the output voltage will be different. Now comes three terminologies. What is balancing? What is zeroing? What is calibration? Now, whenever a yeah, a yeah, transducer is exposed to no cardiac chamber, what should actually be our output? Output should be zero. If the output is zero, then the pressure that is recorded in the pressure transducer will show as zero millimeters of mercury and that is what we want. But sometimes it may give one or two or five or six. So we have to add a variable resistance in G1, G2, G3, G4 in order to get the output zero and that addition is called as balancing. Balancing is an automatic machine created an alteration in the resistances in order to get the final output zero. So once it is zero, the, the technician will tell you, sir, it is balanced. Then you move the transducer up and down till the exit that is going towards the air is at mid chest level. And once this is at mid chest level, then you calibrate the machine that the output is zero at that zero. So now we are actually equating the zero of the transducer to the zero millimeters of mercury for the patient. So zeroing is moving this transducer up and down till this orifice is connected to mid chest level. The third one is calibration. We have to find out whether 100 millimeters of mercury is equivalent to so this is this is basically and yeah yeah in the olden methods yeah, yeah pressure yeah, yeah mercury manometer is connected and it is inflated to 100 millimeters and you see whether the pressure trace will go to 100 but now today's machines are auto calibrated so you if you press an auto calibration machine button immediately it gets calibrated so mostly this balancing calibration is done simultaneously in one go and zeroing is done by just adjusting the 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 opening to the mid chest level the pressure measurement for it to be very accurate, we need to have a short catheter, we need to have a large lumen catheter, 
we need to have a light fluid like saline and we need to have a non compliant rigid catheter so it should not be a collapsible catheter there should not be any blood the catheter lumen should not be three french or two french and it should be the tubing should be shorter it should not be a 500 cm long uh, huge tube what are the artifacts that are created tachycardia is one of the common cause of an artifact this is a beautiful trace of a right atrium that is created at a heart rate of 60 when the heart rate is 60 the frequency of the heart is just 1 hertz the 10th harmonic of the heart's contraction is 10 hertz many of the minor fluctuations such as diacritic notch end diastolic notch c notch everything can be picked up at 10th harmonic so if you want a 10th harmonic your natural frequency has to be 30 to 40 hertz majority of our transducers that we will use in the cath lab are 60 to 80 megahertz as uh, 60 to 80 hertz so if the heart rate is between 60 to 120 we will get good trace but let us assume what happens if the heart rate goes to 180 this is a fast atrial fibrillation 180 you can appreciate the aortic pressure only few beats are opening because the ventricle itself is not opening up the aortic valve this we can understand this is called pulse deficit but atrial pressure is also not showing any trace at all this is because the tachycardia is too fast the ideally the natural frequency frequency for a 10th harmonic at a heart rate of 180 should be 90 to 120 but our machine is only 60 to 80 so it is not able to detect any pressure so first artifact is tachycardia second is under damping under damping means too much of overshoots peak of lv systole everything whatever whatever is the peaks and troughs they are over overshot now how to avoid uh, how to avoid uh, uh, yeah, over damping yeah greater fluid viscosity so if suppose there is a small amount of contrast or blood it will lead to over damping small catheter radius will lead to over damping a bubble clot spasm using multiple three ways these are all causes of over damping so we should we should try to avoid over and under damping the third one is deterioration of frequency response over a period of time the transducer loses its frequency response very often it is due to air leaks or due to blood and variety of things here this is a pulmonary artery pressure you can notice that there is too much of sharp fluctuations which is completely atypical of a normal pulmonary artery trace this is called as deterioration of frequency response and this means the transducer needs to be changed the last the next one is called catheter whip artifact it is the motion of the catheter within a cardiac chamber a typical example is a pulmonary artery pressure that is put in with the swan gans catheter you know that the swan gans will keep popping up and down so this is the type of trace you you are your systolic and your diastolic there are so many traces ideally speaking it should be like this but there is too much of catheter whip and each time the balloon floats towards or away it produces too much of artifact this is called catheter whip artifact end pressure artifact whenever you are having an aortic stenosis you make the catheter tip face towards that aortic valve the forward flow will actually increase the pressure here so in an aortic stenosis an end hole catheter upstream so it will increase the pressure now in a pulmonary stenosis down, the catheter is actually downstream because the catheter the, the jet is going this direction and the catheter is also facing the opposite so the so pressure is reduced due to suction effect this is called end pressure artifact catheter impact artifact this is an example of a right atrial pressure but the catheter has got lodged into the right atrial appendage so each movement of the right atrial appendage is going to produce too much of too much of uh, fluctuations this is called catheter impact artifact this can happen in valves like mitral valve it can happen in papillary muscles as in left ventricle it can happen in right atrial wall right atrial appendage wall it can happen on the right side due to moderator band this is called catheter impact artifact you have to free the tip of the catheter away peripheral systolic amplification most of you will know femoral artery will have a much more augmented pressure due to the reflected waves and this is a peculiar phenomenon of uh, of aortic pressure as you move from central to periphery zero level error you put a patient in a lying posture and you start recording the pressure suddenly the patient becomes pulmonary edema you lift the patient with four or five pillows but the transducer level is at a lower level so the patient moves up and down and this is called zero level error what is balancing error after a small period of time the we have already set the balancing in such a way that if there is no pressure at one end the z- the output will be zero now but that keeps on drifting and this zero drifting will need a rebalancing so this is a yeah 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 zero drift that has happened and then you rebalance and get it back to normal then calibration error if suppose if you have the calibration to 100 mm of mercury or 200 mm of mercury is wrong you will have 
the same vessel that is being connected one vessel is showing much higher pressure and another vessel is showing much lower so this calibration error has to be corrected by recalibrating the machine and after the recalibration you can now identify that there is left ventricle and right ventricle or more the, the left ventricle in two transducers are more or less matching so this is called calibration error entrapment artifact if the catheter tip is caught inside a sac this is a patient who has no aortic stenosis only aortic regurgitation but the catheter is trapped into one of the left ventricular trabecular and this is recording now a high pressure if you pull it out then it will become normal progressive flattening to sine wave when there is a systolic diastolic there is no wave form at all this is due to some thrombus air or something in the tips of the catheter so you flush it and you'll get it back to normal this is commonly seen in intensive care units and the last one is related to physiology you can have too much of fluctuations depending on the respiration of the patient and whenever a patient is under hydrated the fluid dependence of the hemodynamics is exaggerated so this is an underhydrated patient where each of the breathing will be exag exaggerating the respiratory movement because the the limited amount of fluid that is present in the right atrium and right ventricle will not will be too much dependent on the respiratory variations and so this is physiological variation so this is how your pressure recording is being done and how to understand an abnormal pressure recording the third one now we are going into how to interpret different chamber pressures this is an atrial pressure typically we have to see a x b y and we need to understand that there will be an inspiratory increase and an expiratory reduction in all the intracardiac pressures this is the normal but mean which is taken for an average of the entire page may remain constant if you put the mean as beat to beat mean then you will have a mean also going up and down and this will create a difficulty for us to find out what is the mean pressure and hence majority of the cath labs will use a mean which is averaging the page entire page it's actually the mean is an artificially created data which is area under the curve now we have to pay a very careful attention to all the wave forms this is the patient with a mitral stenosis where we are finding a transmitral gradient but the steep vy descent and the tall v wave will make us think that whether it is a mitral regurgitation however if you carefully see the v to y descent is much 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 longer the y is almost happening just to prior to the p wave it is so late so this means this particular patient is having tight mitral stenosis because the vy descent is very slow on the contrary this is an example of a mitral regurgitation where the vy descent the y is happening almost in the earlier part of the diastole itself so vy descent so each and every wave needs needs to be understood in these patients ventricle between right and the left ventricle left ventricle is more rectangular and right ventricle is more triangular even though the ivct and ivrt of a right ventricle is smaller the right ventricle will continue to keep on increasing the pressure till the mid of systole or late of systole late part of systole that is the peculiar of a right ventricle whereas left ventricle will reach its peak at the end of isovolumic contraction itself and hence throughout the systole it is able to maintain a rectangular plateau so rectangular pattern is lv triangular pattern is rv we also need to find out what is the end diastolic pressure and I, and look at the waveform characteristics in aorta we have to understand that the initial upstroke is the percussion wave the later part of the build up of the aorta in systole is the tidal wave then the diacrotic notch and the diacrotic wave both the diacrotic wave and the tidal waves are actually reflected in the periphery Last, oh sorry if is it time madam i have another 5 more minutes can i go 50 more seconds dr shiva we want some time for discussion also okay madam okay okay sure then um, madam then i will stop here madam so that if there are any questions then i will i will i'll stop sharing okay let's see if there are any questions this is a very very important and interesting topic for the residents and i'm sure uh, it would have really helped them to understand the basics so i'm just wondering if there are any questions i don't see any question on the i will i'll then go through the powerpoint a little bit yes so then if there are anything you can stop me madam yes yes please do that thank you are you able to see my slides again not yet Sorry. you need to share the screen
So I would like to encourage the students to ask questions. This is the only uh, time where you can ask at least 10 examiners are in the panel. This is the only opportunity you will get to ask questions from 10 examiners. Dr. Shiva, can you can you share your screen? Yes, madam. Madam, I am just getting it back. I closed it and so then it is taking time. Okay. Dr. Rama, we have five more minutes. Uh, this way, I have 10 minutes for discussion. You can start the discussion part now. Right? Because I don't see any questions from the residents. Okay, we can we can we can see your screen, Shiva. Yes, madam. So now having understood what are the individual chamber pressures, now let us understand why we are doing in individual catheterization in each and every individual lesion. In general, in the left right shunt lesion, if we have to do a cath, it is for deciding the operability. A large proportion of this decision is taken based on symptoms. Very young age, we always assume that they are operable. Clinical findings of hyperkinetic circulation, cardiomegaly and plethora on the X-ray, appropriate chamber enlargement on the ECG, right, eight, right ventricle for a, a pre-tricuspid shunt and left ventricle for a post-tricuspid, volume overload and shunt pattern on the echocardiogram, pulse oximeter and oxygen saturation on exercises. However, there will be certain situations where you will be doing some catheterization. For example, ASD with significant pulmonary hypertension is seen in about 5 to 6 percent of the patients. By and large, they can be grouped into two groups. Number one group, genetically predisposed, younger patients, often the ASD is less than 2 centimeters and these patients probably are on substrate of idiopathic pH. The second group is progressive RV, larger and larger stroke volume leading to endothelial shear stretch and pulmonary vascular disease. Often here the ASD is more than 2 centimeters and the patients are often in 4th or 5th decade. So based on their age, we may be able to understand. The criteria for operability in these patients will be a QP by QS of more than 1.5 with PVRI less than 6 and the PVR by SVR ratio less than 0 0.3. If you are using uh, yeah, PA to aorta diastolic pressure ratio, it is less than 0.4. And whenever you are doing a vasodilator testing with any form, whatever it is, whether it is just an oxygen or oxygen with nitric oxide, then it is 20% reduction in PA mean, PVRI, PVR by SVR ratio. And the rule is there should not be any significant step down in the left atrium at all. Now coming to post tricuspid shunts. If in a large, very large post-tricuspid shunt, ideally speaking, the aorta and pulmonary artery will be almost looking similar if the patient is having a significantly elevated PA pressures. However, when we are giving a vasodilator challenge like nitric oxide or like oxygen, the diastolic pressure in a VSD will keep on falling progressively the low, thereby creating a diastolic separation. And this peculiarity is a feature of VSD. In order to understand it, in a VSD, left ventricle and right ventricle are freely communicating with each other and the RV is communicating to PA and LV is communicating to aorta. So all the four pressures, systolic pressures are exactly the same. So there will be systolic equal pressures throughout in a large ventricular septal defect. Whereas in a PDA, let us see what happened. PDA, ideally speaking, aorta, the, the aorta and pulmonary artery are totally in the same level. So ideally speaking, both the pressures should be similar. However, on oxygen or on nitric oxide, there is a left to right shunt that increases the PV return and increases the LA, LV filling and the LV now ejects with a higher stroke volume. When there is a higher stroke volume, this is called as the impulse gradient. So there is an impulse that is transmitted suddenly into the aorta. So the aortic systolic pressure is higher. However, in diastole, since both of them are communicating with each other, both the pressures will fall back. So diastole will be equal in a PDA, large PDA, whereas diastole will separate in a large VSD because in diastole, both the semilunar wells are closed. So the two, the two pulmonary artery and the aorta are now left as two isolated circulations and hence diastolic can fall. Of, of course, whenever you are doing a balloon occlusion, you will have a significant separation. The different time at which patients will present with Eisenmenger for different level of shunts will be in AP window and PDA, since the pulmonary artery is facing the systemic pressure both in systole and diastole throughout, there is more and more of shear stress and circumferential stretch and hence there is too much of pulmonary hypertension and hence they tend to present very, very early. Between AP window and PDA, AP window is like a window. There is no resistance across the flow through the window. So it often presents in very, very early, first decade itself, whereas PDA is like more like a tube. So it adds to some resistance. And so there is, it goes to second decade. Whereas in VA, in VSD, the PA faces only systemic pressures, only in systole. So slightly the, pro the, the presentation is later. And ASD obviously will be much later. 
we have to understand whenever we are catheterizing a patient for a shunt lesion the confounders like airway obstruction bronchopneumonia reactive airway disease bronchopulmonary dysplasia anemia and polycythemia hypothyroidism b1 deficiency chronic lung pathology and all these are conditions that may alter the pvr and hence we need to be aware about it one of the one of the pattern that is done in 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 shunt assessment in pda is a duct temporary occlusion wherein you separate the aorta aorta goes up the pulmonary artery goes down and if the patient is having a, a stable rhythm you will find that there is a bradycardia around this time this is called as the nicodalani branham effect the heart rate slightly slows down when you are occluding the ductus when the, you continue to occlude it for a short while then there will be a wide separation and this is also considered as a sign of operability down syndrome is a very peculiar situation often we will be doing cardiac catheterization because of questionable operability we have to understand that since down syndrome has frequent respiratory tract infection they have a reduced pulmonary vascular tree development the large vsd on a small pulmonary vasculature will transmit the entire lv pressure on to the entire pulmonary vasculature so they are more susceptible for ph airway hypoplasia obstructive sleep apnea and their vascular response itself being a syndrome itself will be very abnormal so they tend to develop pulmonary vascular resistance very uh, common sorry sorry dr shivkumar there are multiple questions have cropped up now so i am stopping here yeah maybe we can we can have take those questions like sure thank you shiva how do i see the questions so maybe we'll it's in the q and a okay. i am able to see some questions how to differentiate between pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and a la wave pattern basically right. we need to understand that the pulmonary capillary wedge pressure will be partially be damped left atrial pressure because it is being transmitted through the pulmonary capillaries there is going to be a phase delay of about 100 to 120 milliseconds delay between pulmonary capillary wedge pressure and the true left atrial pressure in the left atrial pressure you can quantify things like a vy descent and all but in pulmonary capillary wedge pressures you just take mostly what is the mean pressure and be satisfied with that there is another question what are the steps we should take if we cannot see an edp notch unfortunately we need to see an edp notch then only we will be able to appreciate what is the end diastolic pressure the way in which automated machines today do an edp measurement is they will drop a line exactly at the peak of the r wave or in some of the machines it is 0.003 seconds after the r wave and that is taken as the end diastolic pressure we need to be very sure that the pressure recording is very accurate and the the transducer's frequency response is very good so that you are you are not having an artificially elevated end diastolic pressure there is one more question is there a drill that can be followed before recording these pressures to avoid all these artifacts yeah the 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 the, the, the best method is set up the transducer flush the transducer completely very nicely so that there are no air bubbles at all put the patient on table and then take the zero line to the mid mid chest level and once it is done tell the actually today what is happening is the machines are all far more advanced it is not like what was there about 10 or 15 years before so previously we used to have a separate balancing calibration and all now it is all auto done like you you just set the transducer and immediately it balances and it calibrates especially the new philips the new siemens all of them they they will they will quickly set up uh, the machine the only problem will be if you overuse a transducer for many many months together like uh, you use it for one year then these transducers tend to deteriorate and you need to understand identify and take it out and from Shiba, can end, you please answer the rest of the questions online because we've run out of time yes madam yes please, ma please answer them live online and okay, i would request to dr tyagi to introduce the next speaker please sure okay. thank you shiva the next speaker is dr hari kishan he will speak on the constructive pericarditis versus restrictive cardiomyopathy the hemodynamics which is a very important area of, of uh, evaluation i invite professor harikeshan for this good evening <coughs> respected chairs and uh, dear students uh, can you see my screen and uh, hear me well yes we can see your screen we can hear you also thank you thank you madam uh, rama and the pcsi for this uh, opportunity uh before going uh, to the uh, uh, discussion on hemodynamics we should understand two things in constrictive pericarditis the restriction 
is at the pericardial level and in rusty cardiomyopathy the myocardium is the problem the restriction is at the myocardial level this is the basic difference what are the common features between constriction and restriction both are diastolic abnormalities both have elevated diastolic pressures and ventricular filling is mostly in early diastole these are the features in common so you should know how to differentiate between constriction and restriction you should know two three things one is that in as i said then constricted pericardium is the restraint is of the pericardium the myocardium is normal because and that the septum which is a part of the myocardium that is normal so it can shift to either side on respiration in restricted cardiac myopathy it is a myocardial disease the septum is stiff it cannot shift to right or left based on respiratory phases that is a basic difference so you don't have any respiratory variation in a restricted cardiac myopathy but you have all those variations in constriction what are the hemodynamic features of uh, constriction elevation of cardiac filling pressures pressures due to restriction of by inserted by the pericardium diastolic equalization of pressures in all chambers diastolic filling restricted to early diastole the kusmol sign which i will discuss heightened ventricular interdependence these uh, points we will discuss in detail diastolic equalization fixed pericardium exert an equal contact pressure on all the chambers so this causes elevation and equalization of the diastolic pressures and this will be within 5 mm uh, in all the cardiac chambers this is the hallmark of pericardial constriction equalization and elevation of diastolic pressures and the difference will be less than 5 mm and which all the chambers the differences between the uh, less than 5 mm in mean right atrium rv end diastolic v end diastolic pulmonary capillary veins mean lv end diastolic pressure and pericardial pressure so all these are will be equal and this is diagnostic for constriction but this can also be seen in tamponade the diastolic equalization is not unique to constriction but is also seen in decompensated left heart failure severe tr acute mr rv infarction and cardiac tamponade but in some situations like uh, uh, the cases with uh, localized pericardial constriction or very dehydrated patients or normal right atrial pressure the diastolic equalization may not be uh, obvious in a constriction the second thing is loss of transmission of intrathoracic pressures uh, so normally what happens is there is a inspiratory decrease in intrathoracic pressure which is transmitted to all the cardiac chambers decrease in pressure in the this leads to decrease in pressure in the pulmonary veins and the uh, left atrium and left ventricle so decrease in pulmonary capillary wedge or the pulmonary ve venous pressure is accompanied by a corresponding decrement in the intra chamber pressures so the gradient that drives the lv filling is maintained normally but in constriction what happens is that the pulmonary veins are extra pericardial whatever inspiratory decrease in the intra thoracic pressure is transferred to the pulmonary veins but not to the la or lv so decrease in the uh, pulmonary venous uh, pressure is not accompanied by a corresponding decrease in the lv pressure so the, there is a less gradient that drives lv filling so the, there is a inspiratory decrease in lv filling so it allows the increased rv filling due to other reasons like the uh, the, the flow from the ivc is increased due to the uh, increase in intra abdominal pressure and the ivc is not affected by the in uh, the heightened intra thoracic pressure so the ivs shift to the left the opposite occurs in expiration so this is the concept so this is what is in graphically you can see that in inspiration the uh, septum shift to the left side in expiration the septum shift to the right side now we will see what are the events atrial events elevated right atrial pressure the small sign rapid wide descent or the frederick sign because the atrial filling occurs only in early diastole once the early diastole the atrium fills then it reaches a particular pressure beyond which the filling is not possible or allowed then there is a preserved x descent because the preserved atrial and ventricular relaxation the x descent is due to the atrial and ventricular relaxation in restricted cardiac myopathy due to the myocardial abnormality uh, the relaxation is not happening so it is a blunted x descent in a restriction but is there x descent is preserved in a in a uh, constriction the ins, inconspicuous positive waves and prominent descents this will lead to the m or the w pattern in a constrictive pericarditis so uh, this is an example of one of our cases 
the right atrial vein in this uh, patient is uh, 25 millimeters. One another point is that in constriction, the, L, the right atrial vein will not go beyond 25 usually. If it is more than 25, it indicates a more likely to be a restricted cardiomyopathy, which, which where it can go higher. The pulmonary capillary beds mean is 26. Um, you can see here the, the prominent Y descent, uh, uh, preserved X descent, and showing the M or the W pattern. Coming into small sign, the observation of a jugular venous pressure that rises with inspiration. What happens is that the respiratory variation in intrathoracic pressure with inspiration is not transmitted to the heart chamber. So, whatever increase in venous return cannot be accommodated by the right side and it is manifested as a, a rise in JV. Ventricular events, as I said, the ventricular filling is restricted to early diastole. When there is a rapid filling wave, which is more than 7 millimeters, that is a, one of the criteria to diagnose a, 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 a restrictive physiology. Abrupt halt to ventricular filling, once the limit is set by the pericardium, this will lead to a dip and plate pattern or the square root side. Equalization of the LV and RV diastolic pressures, as we, are, we know that there is equalization of pressures in all the channels. And exaggerated ventricular interdependence or what is called a ventricular discordance. We will see one of the tracings and discuss. So normally what happens is that uh, the atrial pressure slowly rises. And uh, finally, you will have an atrial contraction which uh, completes the uh, ventricular, uh, the diastolic filling. In constriction, what happens is that the filling is restricted to early diastole. Once it reaches that particular pressure, then it stops. Then there is no further filling. So this is the dip and plateau pattern and uh, the early diastolic filling dip and plateau. So filling is restricted to initial on third of diastole, square root sign or dip and plateau. This is the rapid filling wave I said. The rapid filling wave uh, more than 7 millimeters is an indicator of a restrictive physiology. So this is the patient, uh, the tracing of the same patient, elevation of the end diastolic pressures of LV and RV. You can see that they are elevated and almost the same, the end diastolic, uh, the diastolic pressures. Both have the, uh, the, the uh, dip and plateau fat. Now we will come to the exaggerated respiratory variation or the ventricular interdependence. Though this uh, tracing you can see, uh, the red one is the inspiration and the, uh, the uh, green one is the expiration. What you can see is that during inspiration, as I have said, due to the different mechanisms which I discussed, the right when the left uh, ventricular uh, output will come down and the right, right sided uh, output will go up. So there is a rise in the RV pressure and a de decrease in the LV pressure. So, this is the ventricular discordance. This is called the ventricular discordance. So, this is the pressures of the same patient. You can see that RV and the LV ED are high, 30 millimeters. RI mean is 29, LV ED is 30. Again, uh, the pulmonary uh, capillary uh, uh, wedge mean is 30. And here the PA diastolic is also 30 millimeters. Uh, right atrium, you can see this tracing is already discussed. The mean is around uh, 28. Pulmonary capillary wedge is high, RV and LV ED is elevated and showing the, uh, the, the dip and plateau pattern and showing that the last, the, the lower uh, uh, one shows the ventricular interdependence, heightened ventricular interdependence. So these are the hemodynamic features of constriction, elevation of filling pressures, diastolic equalization of pressures in all chambers, early diastolic rapid filling, prominent wide descent of Frederick sign, square root pattern. Uh, of in ventricular filling, ventricular discordance, and small sign. These are the hemodynamic features of a constrictive pericarditis. Now coming to restrictive cardiomyopathy. We know that restrictive cardiomyopathy is a myocardial disease. The myocardium is abnormal. So all the features of myocardial dysfunction will be evident in a uh, restrictive cardiomyopathy. Uh, the elevated right atrial pressures, prominent Y descent, uh, blunted X descent, as I already said, because there is a poor atrial relaxation and a limited descent of the annulus because the myocardium is abnormal. The atrial myocardium also, as also the ventricular myocardium is abnormal. So the relaxation and limited descent that lead to a blunted X descent. And there is a prominent Y descent due to the restrictive, the early diastolic filling. But what are the ventricular events? The restricted ventricular filling, dip and plateau pattern, elevated filling pressures. Here the Myocardium is abnormal. So, the left ventricular end diastolic pressure is higher than the 
right ventricular end as is pressured by at least 5 mm so this is an important criteria lvd more than the right ventricular ed more than 5 mm higher lvdp higher pa pressures because of the higher ventri left ventricular pressure same will be reflected and the, the pulmonary arterial pressure will be higher in a restricted cardiomyopathy and usually it will be more than 50 mm and constriction it will be it will, it will be usually below 50 mm on mercury there is no respiratory variation because the septum is stiff it cannot move with the respiration and then so there is no ventricular interdependence so again you can see the ra min is 25 the y descent uh, uh, blunted x descent uh, yeah, rv pressure is 75 ed is 25 pa pressure is 75 by 28 rv and uh, lv ed uh, this is a low resolution uh, 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 the gray gain is at 200 so we, we are not able to see the difference there is no respiratory variation uh, in respiratory cardiomyopathy because the chambers and septum are minimally distensible so there is little respiratory variation in flow or pressure uh then respiratory mitral inflow velocity in uh, restriction there is a minimal variation less than 10 percentage but in constriction you can see uh, one of the criteria is more than 25 to 30 percent at least 15 percent increase in expiration that is the one of the criteria so you can see that there is a significant variation in inspiration and expiration uh, other criteria lvdp rvdp difference i have already said uh, constriction is less than 5 restriction it is more lvdp is more rv edp by rvsp because rv systolic pressure is higher and restriction it is less than one third pulmonary artery systolic pressure is already discussed less than 50 more than 50 then there is systolic area index that is uh, less than 0 0.1 1.1 1 .1 in constriction and uh, more than 1.1 .1 in constriction less than 1.1 .1 in a restricted cardiomyopathy echocardiography uh, i will show some of the uh, 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 findings in echocardiography Systolic function is preserved in constriction and in early stages of restriction. Diastolic dysfunction in both. Myocardial abnormality in RCM. Uh, respiratory variation absent. Ventricular concordance in RCM. There is no discordance. Uh, uh, these are the echo findings. Respirophasic ventricular shift, also called a septal bounce. I will show an echo picture. Increased mitral E velocity, E by ratio more than 1.6 in expiration. Respiratory variation of the mitral in e wave, e wave velocity, I said, at least more than 15. Prominent expiratory diastolic flow reversal in hepatic veins. This is uh, uh, said to be one of the very specific signs of in constriction. The reversal ratio more than 0.79. Then uh, the other points like annulus, reverses, annular, uh, that I will discuss. Then uh, there is a constrained circumferential and preserved longitudinal. Normally, we know that the lateral E is more than medial E, but in constriction, the medial E is uh, more than the lateral E because the lateral uh, uh, annulus is tethered due to constriction, the, physio the pathology of constriction. This is called annulus reverses the lateral by medial E more than 0.91. Then the tissue doper imaging, the mitral annular E is uh, more than 8 because the myocardium is normal. E by E prime less than 15 is uh, suggestive of constriction. Now, that is called annulus paradox. Because normally, the E by E prime is directly proportional to pulmonary capillary wedge and LV filling pressure. E by E prime more than 15 suggestive of LV elevated filling pressure, as we all know. In constriction, despite an elevated filling pressure, E by E prime is less than 15, and thus, thus, thus the term. Uh, this is called annulus paradox. Hepatic vein flow, uh, uh, I am not going to the details due to lack of time. This is considered as one of the uh, very specific uh, findings in constriction. Prominent diastolic flow reversal in expression. The ratio more than 0.79 is very specific. And restricted cardiomyopathy, there is not much respiratory variation. So to among these, uh, which are the specific and uh, uh, sensitive ones, and the sensitivity is high in almost all the uh, parameters, but the specificity is, specificity is very low, except in the, uh, the, the respiratory variation hemodynamics. That is the more specific ones. This is the last slide. 
കൺസ്ട്രക്ഷൻ വേഴ്സസ് റെസ്ട്രിക്ഷൻ കൺസ്ട്രെയിൻഡ് ഓഫ് ദ പെരിക്കാർഡിയം വേഴ്സസ് റെസ്ട്രിക്ഷൻ ഡ്യൂ ടു ദ ഡിസീസ്ഡ് മയക്കാർഡിയം ദാറ്റ് ഇസ് എ പത്തോളജി ദോ ഇൻ റെസ്ട്രിക്ട് കാർഡിയം ആയപ്പോൾ ഇറ്റ് ഇസ് എ മയക്കാർഡിയം വിച്ച് ഇസ് ഡിസീസ്ഡ് റേസ്ഡ് ഫില്ലിംഗ് പ്രഷേഴ്സ് എയർലി ഡയസ്റ്റോളിക് ഫില്ലിംഗ് ടു സ്മോൾ സൈൻ ആർ കോമൺ ടു ബോത്ത് റെസ്പിറേറ്ററി വേരിയേഷൻ വെൻട്രിക്കുലാർ ഡിസ്കോർഡൻസ് ആനുലാർ പാരഡോക്സ് ആനുലസ് റിവേഴ്സസ് ആൾ ആർ ഫീച്ചേഴ്സ് ഓഫ് കൺസ്ട്രക്ഷൻ എൽ വി ഇ ഡി മോർ ദാൻ ആർ വി ഇ ഡി മോർ ദാൻ ഫൈവ് മില്ലിമീറ്റർ എൽ വി ഇ ഡി പി മോർ ദാൻ ട്വന്റി ഫൈവ് ഹയർ പി എ പ്രഷേഴ്സ് മോർ ദാൻ ഫിഫ്റ്റി നോ റെസ്പിറേറ്ററി വേരിയേഷൻ ഇൻഡിക്കേറ്റീവ് ഓഫ് ആർ സി താങ്ക് യു ഫോർ യുവർ പേഷൻ ലിസൺ Thank you, Professor Hari Kishan, for such an uh, extensive and uh, interesting differentiation between restrictive cardiomyopathy and restrictive pericarditis. If there are any questions to Professor Hari Kishan, please. There are any question and answer sessions. You may select that and answer. I, I don't think there is any question as of now. Hmm. Okay. Then we can go on to the next presentation. a very important part of the management of congenital heart disease is to assess the operability of the patient this is something which is often you know of practical importance as to when we need to put these patients for repair and for intermediate uh, procedures and when we should say that this can't be done anymore so i think some practical tips uh, we are going to get from dr krishna kumar he is from kochi and uh, i'm sure we are going to have some questions also from him which we did not have for the last two lectures so hopefully we'll have some questions from the from the students or the residents which are attending this program so dr krishna kumar please thank you uh, and sorry for joining in somewhat late uh, my talk is on assessment of operability it's a question that uh, you know often is asked and we still haven't resolved it after so many years of uh doing some uh, so much of experience that we've collected collectively we haven't found a very precise answer uh, this topic will be uh, covering some basic concepts and uh, what methods we follow today how when do we do catheterization and what are the tools we have of the various methods that we have uh, we have a number of tools and what are the limitations of them so this uh, paradigm i have always uh, been using which is that there are four elements which is the anatomy of the defect the size as well as the location associated conditions like uh, sometimes a stenotic valve or upper airway obstruction and uh, a number of influences that we don't fully understand which are perhaps genetic and of course the age or the duration of exposure to high flow there is a conceptual framework that everybody needs to understand that pre tricuspid shunt actually result in gradual increase in qp as rv accommodates and enlarges and uh, typical examples are asd and papvc papvc sometimes behaves this way but papvc can also produce a disproportionate amount of pah so it's a slightly different uh, situation but most asds and papvcs the pre tricuspid shunt the qqp qs gradually increases whereas in post tricuspid there is a direct transmission of the pressure head because the shunt is between high pressure chambers and as a result the the, the you know you have a, a, a systolic transmission in vst and systolic as well as diastolic transmission of pressures in pda and ap window uh, if you have pulmonary venous hypertension increasingly it's obvious that it's Uh, it actually uh, masks the whole picture it may in introduce a element of re uh, reversibility by protecting the pulmonary vasculature and it's a concept that we and in, in india have come to appreciate very well but i don't think it is uh, understood worldwide and people are quite surprised as to how we take decisions in these patients we are publishing this but uh, it, 
definitely if you have significant pulmonary venous hypertension then all your rules do not apply until you've eliminated the pulmonary venous hypertension if you have hypoxia it tends to elevate pulmonary vascular resistance and it can confound your assessment and very important factor especially diseases of pulmonary parenchyma upper airway obstruction and you can have a surprising elevation and degree of elevation in pulmonary venous hypertension hypoventilation high altitude all these conditions can completely alter your assessment very important is the duration of exposure so very very significant factor as you increase the duration of exposure the likelihood of pvod increases but the rate of rise is very variable and is de determined by a number of influences so if you take this kind of a, a framework that i have made which is very approximate and you take various lesions uh, you have a, a rough pattern that emerges of course there are exceptions and ast tends to do reasonably well and majority of them are operable um, even till very late in life and those who are destined to become inoperable tend to actually do that relatively earlier than one would think maybe in the second or third decade of life the sinus venosus asd is a little worse than an asd an unrestricted vst or pda tends to be inoperable a little later than most other serious sinister conditions but by second year of life you would like to close all large vsds perhaps ideally by the first year of life truncus behaves has a much more rapid progression towards pvod transposition with large vst and pda you hardly would ever encounter somebody who's operable at the age of 4 or 5 years of age so these rules are approximations there is going to be a standard deviation around each of these curves but by and large they apply of course there is a lot of variability you had i have seen so many children with asd that come with severe ph large asd large flow yet also have severe ph we've had vsts in a 3 month old that looks like eisenmenger or and never reverses we've had i have had a 37 year old with an operable ap window we've all come across these fantastic examples so we tend to remember them and that makes it very difficult to predict in an individual patient there is definitely a genetic influence that we really must study and you have a bell shaped curve when it comes to the risk of pvod at one end of the curve you have this patients who are inoperable or remain operable no matter what happens and though there are others that are very rapidly progressing perhaps we are looking at some examples of iph at the very end of the spectrum so the principles are very simple for relatively simple for trying to distinguish between post tricuspid and pre tricuspid the rule for post tricuspid is if there is a significant shunt in the basal state demonstrable in the basal state irrespective of pa pressure generally they are operable particularly if this is a young child as they get older it becomes a little more difficult but by and large if you find large shunt demonstrable whichever way you choose to demonstrate it, they are operable whereas in pre tricuspid any degree of pulmonary hypertension even if it's more than mild warrants concern and especially if this is true if the basal shunt is not obvious so you have to be a little more worry of pulmonary hypertension in pre tricuspid shunt because that is not so easily explained age is very very important so you give the benefit of doubt to younger people a one year old with ESV, vst and severe ph where shunt is not so obvious you may actually err towards operable operations whereas if you get an older child with a similar situation you your whole decision is going to be different lung airway ventilation issues are very very important and you have to take them not just during cardiac catheterization but during all times of assessment you take a down syndrome with a vst and you put them for after sedated echo you might find a totally different set of hemodynamics on echo and you might decide something altogether different so you have to be respectful and mindful of that as well as of course pulmonary venous hypertension that i talked about uh post tricuspid shunts are generally operable this, this is what i have said and then of course um, sorry i just moved ahead so this is the paradigm that we all have when it comes to left to right shunt it's a oversimplified paradigm that you have at one point things becoming inoperable and those becoming operable depending on the degree of damage to the pulmonary vasculature in general it's a gray so it's a, it's a it's a spectrum and you have a whole range of possibilities and there is clearly operable patients where there's no doubt younger patient with a large shunt clearly inoperable patients 
and lots of borderline. That's where we have to take a decision. So here's an example, child, large VST, and of course, completely left right shunt, big X-ray. Nobody has any doubt, LALV enlarged. You would never catheterize this patient. Similarly, you have an Eisenmenger, Frank, with blue, single, loud S2. Nobody in India is going to catheterize this patient. Of course, the people in the West still catheterize because they don't encounter this frequently. And this comes in, if you look at their guidelines, they say you should catheterize these patients, but that's perhaps not indicated here. And of course, you see this echo and you really don't waste time or resources uh, on these patients unless they have a very specific issue that you have to address in the cath lab. So in the post tricuspid spit shunt, those who are operable, Largely, you can make clinical decisions. You have failure to thrive, precordial activity. So clinical evidence of a large shunt. And in the other extreme, you have cyanosis, quiet precordium, very the absence of flow murmurs, um, typical X-ray with peripheral pruning, uh, and so to some extent, ECG is helpful. 